my my background is that I have um, you know I've been in the stroke field for about thirty years and um, have uh, as a twin said been uh, the director of the stroke program at CPMC and actually work around the Bay Area. We have a regional stroke system where we have a network of different hospitals around the Bay Area that are connected to us um, by telemedicine and by um, a variety of different other communication routes so that way we can um, manage patients across the whole system. So we have pretty good experience in taking care of patients with a wide variety of different vascular problems. And, um, you know, I want to just communicate to you all of the new advances and things that are occurring in the field because it's, it's become quite um, um, advanced in terms of the way that we can take care of patients. So um, I'm going to leave the questions to the end because this format does not really lend itself to, you know, question and answer during the presentation. So if you have questions, as Twin said, just, you know, either put them in the chat box or, um, you know, send them to her and then we can answer the questions at the end. Hopefully we'll have um, a fair amount of time at the end to be able to talk about um, different uh, questions that you might have. So uh, let me see if I can get this thing to work now. So. I'm dividing this talk into two parts. Uh, the first part is about acute stroke treatment, which is sort of in the emergency room and sort of if somebody has an acute stroke um, at the time of presentation. And then we'll talk um, in the second part about stroke prevention, about how we can prevent you from having a stroke or if unfortunately you've had a stroke, what else you can do to prevent a second stroke, which is a very relevant area, obviously, for people that have experienced a stroke. Um, this be fast thing. I'm not sure if anybody, many people are familiar with that, but this is sort of the mnemonic that we use in the stroke field for symptoms of a stroke. And so I'm going to go over this again later on in the presentation, but just so people understand what that title is coming from, BFAST is an acronym that stands for balance, eyes, face, arm, speech, and time. And um, we're not going to go into a super detail right now, but these are the different parts of the evaluation or the kind of symptoms that you might experience that you should be looking for. And this is supposed to help you remember um, what to look for in terms of symptoms that might be a cause of stroke. And again, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, but this is just the rationale for why we ask people to remember the term be fast and what it stands for. Um, just um, sort of fast facts or be fast facts about stroke. Um, many people don't know that stroke is the number one cause of disability in the world, and um, it's a, the number five cause of death. Um, it used to be actually in the United States the number three cause of death, but it's gone down over the last uh, 10 or 20 years because of some of the advances that have occurred um, over the past few years. But it still remains the number two cause of death worldwide, so it's still quite a significant cause of mortality as well as um, disability throughout the world. Strokes can be divided into two different types. There's the ischemic stroke, which is caused by a blocked artery, and that's the vast majority of strokes. About 85% of strokes are caused by a blocked artery, um, sort of like a heart attack. But about 15% of strokes are caused by a hemorrhage, uh, that is a burst artery, and that's different from uh, cardiovascular disease where really you don't get hemorrhages into the heart. So that is something that's significantly different between stroke and cardiovascular disease, which is it's often compared to. Um, in addition, um, there's an ethnic difference between um, the hemorrhagic stroke uh, within the Asian community and actually in many minority com communities compared with the white population where there's a much higher rate of hemorrhage within the Asian population, about twice as high in the Asian population, for example, than in the, um, the white population or Caucasian population. The cost is obviously very great in terms of the amount of direct cost just for the hospitalizations and for treatment of individuals with stroke. And there's actually quite a few strokes, um, at least in the U.S., um, uh, per year, about 800,000 strokes per year. And that compares to about 1.1 to 1.2 million heart attacks per year. So it's actually pretty comparable in terms of the frequency. And a lot of people don't realize that um, it is quite a common disease. Um, this is an example of what we're trying to have people not do with a stroke. And this is a very common situation that uh, we see um, in the hospital as well as in the clinic. You have a person that develops some symptoms of some kind, usually it's some kind of weakness. Um, in this case, the person has left-sided weakness and it's always the case or commonly the case that the spouse says, well, you should go to the hospital. And of course the person 
that is experiencing the symptoms doesn't want to go to the hospital and, you know, goes to bed or says, oh, we'll get better in the morning. And we see this pretty frequently, actually. And of course, by the next morning, many hours later, the person has a permanent disability, is paralyzed. And obviously, this is not what you should do in a stroke situation because there's very clearly good treatments that are available now that can significantly reduce the um, the disability from stroke, and um, but it's all dependent on time. And so the earlier you come in, the more likely it is that we'll be able to rescue that tissue and prevent you from having a severe um, deficit. And just to mention COVID-19 and how this uh, plays into this uh, issue, it has had a significant effect on um, our ability to treat patients with stroke. And how does that happen? Well, the main reason is because people are really much more afraid to come into the hospital. We have many um, cases that we've been involved in as well as across the country. This is a na nationwide phenomenon, probably across the world actually, uh, where people are so afraid of coming to the hospital because of the fear of COVID-19 that they're not coming into the hospital. And because of it's a time-based treatment, you, you see a dramatic decline in the number of patients that are um, getting these um, sort of life-saving treatments that are available now. And uh, the estimate is anywhere between 20 and 30 to 40 percent of uh, reduction in the number of patients that are potentially available for treatment. Um, and delayed treatment also leads to worse outcome because again, if you can't treat the person in the time frame that's appropriate, then your chance of having a good recovery is much lower. And also this leads to a higher recurrence chance and also a higher uh, probability of complication. So all of these things contribute to a worse outcome as well as losing the opportunity to be treated. Um, and uh, another thing about COVID patients in particular is that they can experience stroke as their first symptom. And this has been observed around the world um, where the patients that have COVID can present as their first symptom being a stroke and they commonly are the younger, healthier people. So somebody that you might not expect to have a stroke presents with a stroke say when they're in their 40s, commonly strokes occur in your 60s, 70s and 80s. And they often don't have the common symptoms of COVID like fever, cough, and shortness of breath, or the things that we sort of associate with a, a, a infectious, uh, a respiratory infection. And so this leads to, um, number one, the patient not really realizing that they um, have COVID. And number two, from the medical perspective, we have to be careful about patients that come in with stroke, and we have to make sure that they don't have COVID as one of the causes of stroke. Now, obviously, not many patients um, have COVID and stroke at this point because it's still a relatively rare phenomenon, but we do have to worry about that when somebody comes into the hospital, especially if they have no real obvious risk factors for stroke or they're younger. So these two things are, complicate the treatment of patients with stroke and are things that we really have to take into consideration when we're managing such patients. Um, but a very important thing for this audience and for you know all people is that you should really not fear coming to the hospital. We are fortunate in California that the COVID um, penetrance rate into the population has actually been relatively low. It's not like New York City or China or Italy or some of these other places that have had massive increases in the number of patients. We've actually had a very modest increase in patients and we've definitely bent the curve in terms of the a number of patients that have COVID. We have, I think in the hospital right now, we have like three patients that have COVID. So it's very, very low. And um, the hospital and the system has really, and the doctors and healthcare workers have really thought about this in extreme detail and have created all sorts of elaborate precautions for patients. So you're not going to be exposed to COVID. Um, if you come into the hospital, you're not going to be at risk in any significant way. They're, they are monitoring uh, individuals and um, categorizing them appropriately. And again, the prevalence in the hospital is actually very low, at least in the Bay Area. So you should not worry about that. The other important thing is that stroke treatments work very well in COVID patients, and you don't have to worry about, oh, it won't work because you have COVID infection. That, that has no impact at all on the efficacy of the treatments. Um, that being said, I know a lot of people are unsure about what to do, and we have recommended to our patients um, that they call us if they're not sure. You can certainly um, call your, your doctor or even the emergency room. I mean, emergency rooms get calls all the time now about possible COVID patients and all sorts of medical conditions. 
And ironically, it's actually a lot easier to get into the hospital now than it was even two months ago, because again, the hospitals have prepared for a, a huge uh, increase in the number of patients and it didn't happen. So they're actually, the hospitals are pretty empty right now. And you may have heard that, you know, we're trying to repopulate the hospitals now and trying to get patients in more um, that have conditions that, um, you know, may not be emergent, but are urgent. Um, and so um, contrary to popular belief and contrary to what's happening in other parts of the world, we actually have ample capacity and it's very safe in terms of getting patients in and treated. Um, so let's talk about stroke types. Um, I'm not going to get into extreme detail about this, but suffice it to say, it's very complicated in that there are many different subtypes of stroke. As I mentioned before, the 85% of stroke are ischemic or because of blood clots and blood vessels and 15% are hemorrhagic. But even in those two large categories, there's many subcategories. Again, I'm not going to get into it in detail. This is what the doctors have to worry about. Suffice it to say that um, we try and tailor our treatment to the type of stroke that you have because the, the treatments, while a lot of things are common between the different types, some things are different. And so you have to tailor the treatment individually for those specific patients. Um, I'm going to talk just really briefly about the concept of how stroke treatment works. And I'm going to concentrate primarily on the ischemic stroke patients because that's the vast majority of patients. Um, and that's where most of the newer treatments are uh, targeted. So we will talk about saving tissue at risk. That's called the penumbra. And that is the area of the brain or the area of tissue that still is viable, um, even though there's a blood clot there. So you have collateral flow um, that um, is in the brain that could help preserve the, the brain tissue, even though there's a blood clot or a blocked off blood vessel that you can see here, that thrombus uh, in the diagram here. And this penumbra is sort of this darker area that is at risk for becoming an infarction, whereas the infarction itself is sort of this white area right here. And this is a, below here is another schematic. I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Let me put on this pointer. This is another schematic sort of looking at that same thing in a cross section of the brain. So you have this, the, in this particular example, there's a black area or dark area that's the actual dead tissue and then the penumbra is the salvageable tissue. And most patients, especially the earlier you are in the stroke, have a very large penumbra and very little dead tissue. As time goes on, this dead tissue expands and eventually fills in this whole area. And we talk about what's called a mismatch, uh, a perfusion mismatch, which means that you have a, a large area that's at risk but not dead and then there's a smaller area that's dead and that's the kind of patient that you want to treat. You don't want to treat somebody that has all core or all dead tissue because there's no point in doing that and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not going to help that patient because the tissue is already dead. So our technology has really gotten quite sophisticated in being able to identify this uh, penumbra territory or tissue at risk and this thing here is probably the most important thing to know about this is that we can treat patients up to 24 hours after they've had their stroke and still be effective with the treatment. Now, the number of patients that qualify at this longer time window is relatively low, maybe 10% of patients, because again, all that time the tissue is expanding and, and dying uh, during that 24 hour period. But there are about maybe 10% or 15% of patients that even at that 24 hour window, depending on how good their collateral flow is, they can still have viable tissue even at very long time windows. And we've had great success um, in treating such patients when we can identify them. So this is an example of that high technology being really important for treating these, uh, these uh, stroke patients. This is also another um, important thing to remember and it's kind of um, an interesting um, uh, 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 definition of the ratio between how cells survive and how much time matters. So for every minute that a person a person's brain is derived of oxygen, they lose about 2 million brain cells. And another way to think of that is that for every minute that you save uh, the brain tissue, you, you get one day, one day back in your life. So these are very simple, you know, um, concepts to sort of understand and it really helps in sort of figuring out why it's so important even in in, in the stroke world 
even a 10 minute saved is significant because that saves you, you know, days and days of normal life and millions and millions of brain cells. So we worry about very short periods of time and we try and treat patients as quickly as possible. Um, so that way they can get the maximum benefit from the treatment. Um, the main medical treatment for stroke has actually been around for about, God, it's been like 25 years now. I can't believe it's been so long, but it has been for quite a while. It was actually FDA approved in 1996. It's called TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. This was um, created by Genentech, our local company here. And this is a drug that was originally used mostly for heart attacks and subsequently for strokes in the 90s. Um, I remember back then I was around when this happened. Um, and it's quite effective actually for stroke. And one of the biggest changes in the last three years or so is that the time window for treatment has um, dramatically expanded. As of this year, the time window has now gone up to nine hours. When I first started in practice, it was three hours. So in the last 20 or 25 years, we've pushed that window out up to nine hours, again, using that penumbra sort of mechanism, looking at patients to see if they have viable tissue or not. And so this is a significant improvement. And again, we have to make sure that the patients, even at that nine hour window, you want to treat those patients as quickly as possible because every minute that you wait along, you're losing more and more brain cells. So it's very important to try and keep, um, e even though we can treat patients at this time window, that you want to come in much earlier than that because the probability of good outcome is much is strongly tied to the, how much time has passed. But still, some patients can benefit from treatment even up to this longer time window. So um, there's you know, many examples of this, and, and these are just simple examples of um, the kind of treatment that we can do. But what happens if the patient, for example, is outside of that nine-hour time window? Let's say they, like in this particular case, the person had symptoms at 4 o'clock in the morning and didn't get to the hospital until 10 o'clock in the morning and they happened to be at a hospital that was far away from a facility that could do more acute interventions and obviously could not get the IVTPA because they're already outside the time window. What do you do in situations like this? And that's been the other sort of revolutionary thing in our treatment is that we have other types of treatment available now. And um, that is what's called a stent retriever or stent retriever, which is short for stent retriever. And this is called endovascular therapy. And this is using catheters that you put into the, um, the groin area and you run them up to the brain and the arteries and you actually go in and extract the blood clot. So that's why they're called retrievers or it's a clot retriever devices. That's another name for them. And these are um, little stents or little, um, little wire devices that you put in directly through the clot and then you expand it into the clot and then you can pull the clot out. So this is a kind of device that's used and it's actually very compatible with the TPA. So we often, about 80% of the time, will give the IV TPA and then um, if the clot is not dissolving or we think it won't dissolve because it's too big or something, then we'll go to the cath lab and we'll um, extract the clot secondarily. And my analogy for this is sort of if you have um, a clot, a clog in your drain, you know, you have a clog in your drain and it's, and it's not it's not moving. And um, TPA is kind of like Drano. It's like you pour in this liquid in and it sort of dissolves the clog that's in your drain. And this is more like a snake, like one of the snakes that it, that if you have a plumber come in and puts a metal thing in there and sort of push it, pushes it through the clot, it's sort of like that. I mean, it's a lot more elegant than that, but conceptually that's what you're doing. You're using a physical device to get in there and extract the clog, or in this case, the clot from your body, just like you would take out a clog with a snake from your drain. So, and by the same token, that's why we can use combination of both the, the TPA as well as the, the, uh, the, the stent retriever, um, because they are complementary. You can help dissolve the thing at the same time that you're, and maybe reduce the size of it or soften it make it a lot easier for this device to get in there and open up the blood vessel. So they are used in combination and the technology has really evolved over time and there's probably a dozen different catheters now that are available or a variety of different devices. Um, this sort of came out in 2012 so it's relatively new still although I can't believe now it's already been like eight years since this sort of came out. 
And this has really dramatically changed our treatment because now um, um, I'm sure you can imagine that as with your uh, the, the clog in your drain, that Drano often doesn't work on clogs and so you have to go and snake it. This is a much more effective and efficient device. And so if you have the appropriate type of clot in your body, it works very well for removing that clot and does it very efficiently. And this is an example, this is an angiogram of a patient that has this kind of procedure being done. So this, and, uh, and it's actually from that example that I showed before, this is what, exactly what this patient got. So this is actually the catheter being put up into the brain here, and this is the end of the catheter here, and it's going to be snaked up to this point, which is where the clog is, or the clot. So you can actually see the clot here, and in this particular case, the wire that goes through the clot has already gone through it, and you can see the wire way out here. So this is what you do is you put that guide wire through just like in that diagram, and the stent gets expanded into this area, and then you just pull the whole thing back. And it seems pretty, I mean, when I first heard about this, I was like, wow, this is something that seems pretty hairy to do, but it can be done quite safely, and the efficacy of it is quite good. About 80% of the time you can remove the clog or the clot and it works very efficiently for that uh, for that purpose. And when people get this device, if it's done in a timely fashion, the results can be quite traumatic. The patient can literally get better after you do the procedure, sort of just um, um, recover their deficit, their paralysis can go away immediately. Although, you know, in a lot of cases, it takes a little time because there's been some injury to the brain. We do have this so-called Lazarus effect where the person suddenly gets better right after the procedure is done. So it can be quite dramatic in terms of how the recovery occurs in the situation. And so this is an example of after you remove that clog or that clot, this is how the vessel is supposed to look. It has, now it's wide open and you can see the blood flow into the brain being very, very good at this point. And this is this has also given us the opportunity to actually look at these clots and analyze them and see what they're made of. And one of the remarkable things we've observed is how large these are. We've we've had clots that are these are centimeters here, but you know two, four or five inches long, sometimes even eight or nine inches long. So you can have very large what we call clot burden or very large clots within your body. And you can imagine that if you try to use something like TPA, which is very good for smaller clots that it would not work on something like this because it's just too much for the chemical to sort of dissolve and get through all of this. You're going to need a physical device like this to sort of pull out these clots. And so that's why this has been a much more efficient way of removing clots for the, the correct type of patient that has a large enough blood vessel that you can get this device into. So as I mentioned, it, it was approved in 2012. It's quite efficacious compared to our previous technology, which was TPA or other devices. And again, this, it has a quite long time window, which makes it very attractive for people that are um, longer out in the time window for treatment. And this is these are two of the guys that do this at our facility. There's many around the Bay Area, so there's plenty of places that can do this kind of procedure now across the Bay Area. We actually have pretty good representation throughout the Bay. And this is the kind of device that you use. This is a, a catheterization, an angio suite device. It's an x-ray machine. And you can see the images up here that are all the blood vessels. The patient lies here. And this is the x-ray tube sort of looking through the brain so they can do x-rays and see the blood vessels. They shoot dye into these blood vessels so that way they can see what's going on. And then they use those um, maps that they get from this to um, guide the catheter into the brain. And this is all done by hand. You just They just do it by feel, sort of moving their hands through the blood vessels. Pretty amazing stuff. So... Um, at, at CPMC, we use this um, device and this procedure as part of a care delivery system. So um, I mentioned before that you need to um, be able to put these catheters in, but you also have to be able to identify the patient. And so many years ago, I think it's like 10, 15 years ago now, we began this program to be able to do that, not just within San Francisco, but across the Bay Area. And so now we have a regional stroke program where we are able to connect with pa uh, patients across the Bay Area at multiple different facilities um, and use um, telemedicine actually, something like Zoom, to be able to see the patients at these remote facilities. And um, back then when we first started doing this, it was very, you know, avant-garde because, you know, nobody did telemedicine for stroke back then. But now it's very commonplace. And in fact, it, since the COVID has come along, now everybody does telemedicine for everything. We do it in the clinic now. So something that 
originally was very, very um, unusual has now become sort of mainstream. And just like we do Zoom conferences like this now in the past, we never did that kind of thing. So it was pretty avant-garde back then, but I think it's become very mainstream in terms of how we do this kind of treatment now. And it allows us to treat a lot more patients and also um, communicate with the outside facilities so that way we can tell them, yes, this patient should come and be transferred for a treatment, for example, or even if you're at a local facility within San Francisco, if you're, um, say, at one of our sister facilities around the Bay, uh, around uh, San Francisco or in, in, the, in the peninsula area, we can remotely evaluate those patients and decide, are they potential candidates for treatment? So we use this telemedicine. And the main difference between our telemedicine and, say, Zoom or something like that is that we have remote camera control, which means that I have a, a very expensive, very high resolution camera that I control from the remote site. So I can like use a remote control and zoom in on the individual patient and move it around and stuff. I don't need, uh, it's not a static camera, it's a moving camera. So that way we can um, do a, a pretty thorough examination of the patient. And that's not something that's commonly available with, you know, like Facebook or Zoom or something like that. And it makes it so somewhat unique still in terms of being able to much better assess somebody without having them to particularly have to cooperate for that evaluation. So this is our device. It's basically just a computer with a, a very expensive camera on the top. This is a, I think it's a 200 to one zoom camera on it and it's remotely controlled. So I can control it from my, wherever I am, if I'm at home or if I'm at the hospital, a different hospital, I can control this device and I can see what's going on there. And the patient sees us on the other end, just like you're seeing me now. Um, on their, on, um, so we have a two-way communication. And this is me doing one of these um, remote consultations. So this is what it looks like. I'm looking at the patient um, remotely. The camera is actually in the other room. And this is just for this uh, photo purpose. But um, the, the camera is actually in the patient's room. And so we can assess them in that way. And they can see us as well. So we have a quite an extensive network of different hospitals across, um, not, not just across the Bay, but even way up in the north counties and in the south parts of the, um, of the state. And so we can leverage a relatively small number of specialists. So we have uh, 10 or 11 uh, stroke neurologists at our program, and we can cover you know, vast territories with a very few number of doctors. And that really helps us leverage our relatively scarce resources because there's really not that many neuro stroke people um, around the country. There's probably a few, a few thousand at the most. And so relative to the number of patients, there's a, a real shortage of such, such specialists around the country. The other thing that's really helped, and I, I mentioned this before with the imaging, is that we have this uh, specialized neuroimaging that can identify which tissue is viable and which tissue is not. And this has also been very important in identifying those patients because not every patient should get TPA or should get this catheter-based treatment because, as I mentioned, if they already have dead tissue, it's really not useful to do that. And this is an example of that technology. It's literally the same as that picture that I showed you before. This shows how much tissue is dead, and this shows how much tissue is at risk. And there, if there's a mismatch, mismatch, like in this case, where there's no tissue that's dead and there's a a large tissue at risk, this is the ideal candidate for treatment. So literally, the imaging matches what the theory shows. And this has been in conjunction with the, the new technology for the video, as well as the new technology for the stent retrievers, has really revolutionized what we could do. And so we have lots of options now for treatment. We can do various different things um, with different kinds of medications, as well as devices, and be able to treat these patients even remotely, like I can give a patient TPA, you know, 300 miles from here or across the country even um, quite easily by seeing them remotely and looking at the imaging and stuff. And so it's become very high tech in, in terms of how we can do this kind of evaluation. So in this particular case, that's exactly what happened is that the patient was seen by telemedicine, was thought to be a good candidate, he was transferred, by then it was, you know, over nine hours. The imaging that he had showed that he still had salvageable tissue. He got the stent retriever that I showed in the other picture, and he made fantastic recovery. And so this, again, is the combination of all of these different technologies that you need simultaneously in order to be able to coordinate this. And um, it takes a fair amount of effort to do this, but it now it's become sort of routine. I mean, I think that we are... We, we do this like every day now. And so it's become sort of the standard of care of how we want to manage patients like this. But it does completely depend on the individual person 
coming to the attention of the doctor. And so this goes back to my first point, which is that, you know, unless we know that you you come in, unless you come in the hospital with those symptoms or you make the medical system aware, you're not going to get any of these treatments. And you're depriving yourself or your family member or your loved one of this kind of care if they decide that they're not going to come in because if it's after 24 hours or if their tissue is not viable, it doesn't matter how fancy this technology is, it won't work for them. So again, this gets back to what we talked about before about this be fast thing. And so I'm going to go into this a little more detail here, just so you know, this is the kind of things that you should be looking for in terms of symptoms of a stroke. And so the B stands for balance. And so um, patients that have stroke will often have an unsteady gait or lose their balance. Um, their eyes can be involved. They can have visual loss or double vision or some kind of disturbance of their vision. Their face can be involved. They can have weakness or numbness of the face. They can also have headaches. Um, visual loss, I repeated here, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's part of the face exam too. And they can often, often have confusion as well as a symptom. Arm symptoms, you can have weakness and numbness of the arm, you can have clumsiness, speech problems, you can have slurred speech, comprehension can be involved. And T just stands for time. And again, emphasizing the point that if you come in within a certain time interval, we can help to treat you. But the longer you wait, the less likely it is we're going to be able to treat you because that tissue is dying the whole time. So it really relies tremendously on um, awareness of the individual person that's involved um, with the stroke and or their family members. So what are some other characteristics of stroke that differentiate? Because a lot of these things are actually pretty nonspecific. I mean, you can have balance problems from all sorts of things. You can be drunk, for example, and have a balance problem. So how do you differentiate? Well, some of the things that help differentiate are abrupt onset. So strokes, that's why they call them strokes, because they happen very quickly. And so usually they happen over seconds to minutes sometimes over hours, but it's not days or weeks. So if you tell me I've had gradually progressive weakness of my arm for three months, it's not a stroke by definition. It's not going to be a stroke. It's going to be something else. So time really helps us. The faster it comes on and the more suddenly it comes on, the more likely it is it's going to be a stroke. Usually the symptoms are only on one side of your body, either the left or right side, because of just the way the brain is organized. So it's pretty unusual to have like both of your hands being weak or numb at the same time or both sides of your face. It's usually one side of the face is fine and one, the other side is good or the one side of the body is weak and the other side is not. So when you see one-sided symptoms, that's also a tip off that it's probably a stroke or at least some kind of brain problem. Um, however, a lot of the symptoms are nonspecific and there's many, many mimics. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing, and we don't expect a patient to know this, is that you know we have to rule out all sorts of other causes. And in fact, even with our fancy diagnostic tools, even with the fancy imaging and stuff like that, we sometimes have to make a guess. And um, we have to decide, well, you know, could it be a certain type of stroke that we can't detect on the imaging, for example, which there are certain types, or is it so something else? Is it because of stress or anxiety, people can get feel unbalanced and dizzy because of that, low blood sugar can cause, there's other different things. And so that's where sometimes a judgment call comes in. But the more symptoms are like this, the more likely it is we'll be more firm about the diagnosis. And certainly if the imaging verifies it, it is very helpful. So it's much better than it used to be even five years ago. But still, it's it, there is some um, it's not all science in terms of doing this. There is a bit of art. Um, so um, it, this is one of these things where uh, it really depends on um, a combination of the art and science being sort of put together in order to uh, evaluate these patients. Um, this is just talking about um, who calls the ambulance with the stroke because a lot of times um, um, you wonder, well, who needs to know this information? And it actually turns out um, although um, uh, a lot of the time the patient is alone or with their partner only or maybe even a, a family member, almost always or more than nearly half the time, the people that call the ambulance are not the patient or their partner. It's the son or daughter. So actually, and we actually spend some time doing this, is we, we spend time training uh, uh, the children of people that are at risk for strokes or you have a lot of vascular risk factors, it's probably wiser to tell your son or daughter or your partner about it, about what the symptoms are rather than yourself because the chance that you're going to call yourself when you're having a stroke is pretty low. 
again, you're going to be impaired and your brain is not going to be working during that time. So it's more likely that somebody else is going to notice something going on. And I've had personal experience with this. My, my, my dad fell down one time and he was like, he thought he was having a stroke and they live in Seattle and they called me in California because they're like, I'm going to call my son about this. I'm not going to figure it out for myself. And it's very common for us to have that um, as the situation. The other thing is that the more the other members of the family know about stroke and how it's treated, the easier it is to consent people for procedures. Because you can imagine trying to explain this to somebody when I've got five or ten minutes to decide what we're going to do can be very difficult. And you're trying to make a decision about treatment very quickly. Um, and if the family already knows about it, and we've had, I've definitely had personal experience with this where the family sort of was familiar with this, sometimes even from this kind of a presentation, and we don't have to have any long discussion. We just go, yeah, we're going to do this thing or that thing. I know what you're talking about. So having that knowledge base among family members is quite useful. Um, another concept that um, we often talk about is this thing called a TIA, which is called transient ischemic attack, and it's kind of like a mini stroke. It's like stroke-like symptoms, but they go away. And that's usually a warning sign that you're at higher risk for a stroke. Um, usually the symptoms last less than 10 minutes. And if you have a TIA symptoms, there's a pretty significant chance you're going to have a stroke or die within the next three months. So it's an important symptom to identify, and you shouldn't just ignore that symptom. Like if you have weakness or paralysis for a period of time, and then it gets better. And a lot of people... It's common because they say, oh, it just happened once. It's nothing to be worried about. You should actually worry about it, especially if it was abrupt onset and unilateral like I described before because the symptom will be exactly the same as a stroke except it just reverses. And that's just because the blood clot or whatever was causing the problem has gone away. It dissolved on its own or passed through the blood vessel that it was sort of stuck in. And so it only caused transient symptoms. So you really should be checked out by a doctor. And this is one of the biggest uh, difficulties is that just like with the stroke itself, you can have lots of mimics and things that are different things that cause that. Um, and part of the job of the neurologist and the other doctors involved in medical care is to try and differentiate which ones are the stroke symptoms or the TIA symptoms versus other types of causes of things. But you still need to be seen by a doctor because they need to figure that out and, and you should not ignore these kinds of symptoms. So like I said, you have to use common sense to a certain extent. What should I do if I have these symptoms? If you have transient or minor symptoms, you can, you know, you have time to call call your doctor about them and discuss them, either you know by uh, phone or by uh, My Health Online or whatever electronic means you want. Usually, we recommend being evaluated within 24 hours because a pretty high percentage of patients that have a TIA like something will have their stroke within 24 hours. So we try and get these patients treated as quickly as possible so we can, have, we can abort them having their stroke. But if you have significant symptoms, if you're disabled, if you're having weakness and stuff, you should just go to the hospital, call 911. And 911 is much better than um, call, you know driving in yourself because the system is set up for if you come in in an ambulance, you will get immediate care and you're going to get everything done as quickly as possible. If you if you walk in, you may be triaged incorrectly. So we generally recommend for major symptoms that you could, should come in 911. Um, again, um, there's a lot of resistance these days because of the COVID thing and we're trying to allay that concern because we still can function in the COVID situation and still be able to treat these patients efficiently. So the bottom line about this is that we can do a lot for strokes now. You have to recognize the systems. You should be familiar with this BFAST thing or whatever other way you want to remember these kind of symptoms. Time really matters. That's also part of the BFAST. That's the T there. You want to get that cl clot out. And there's two major treatments that we use for ischemic stroke. Um, and you do need experience in doing this. But fortunately, in the Bay Area, and particularly in San Francisco, we have plenty of this kind of experience around. And so we are in a good uh, area in terms of having um, uh, availability of these um, types of treatments. Now, not every center can do that thrombectomy thing. There's only certain sites within San Francisco. So um, if you go to a hospital that does not have thrombectomy capability or stent retriever technology, you're going to be transferred. So if you have the opportunity to figure out which hospital you tend to go to, you can find out, you can call the hospital. For example, the um, 
CPMC, Van Ness campus can do this, and the Davies campus can do this, but not the Mission Bernal campus. So if you go to the Mission Bernal campus, you would have to actually be transferred to either the Davies or the Van Ness campus. And that's the same for some of the other hospitals in the area too. So you actually have to know um, in the area which hospitals are capable of doing this in order to get the fastest care possible. So I'm gonna switch gears um, quickly at this point and talk about prevention of stroke. Um, this is a, a much more broad sort of topic and um, potentially more relevant to a lot of people that um, ask about stroke because many, many people are concerned about having a stroke. Obviously, it's a very common cause of disability and there's many, many people that know other people that have had a stroke. So that uh, lends itself to um, asking questions about how you can prevent it. And it's pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, we know a lot about stroke risk. We know what the relative risk from different things are. By far and away, the most important thing is high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, and alcohol use are other potential factors that are important. There's a lot of untreatable risk factors, like your age and sex. Males have a higher risk of stroke. Older um, individuals have a higher risk of stroke. Um, Non-Caucasian people have a much higher risk of stroke. Um, so there are things that you can't really control, but if you have those things, you need to be aware, so that way you can control the things even more aggressively that you do know about or that you can treat. And an important co concept is that over 90% of strokes are preventable. So you, if you just control people's hypertension, 50% of strokes would be um, eliminated. And so, and you can see some of these other things that you can prevent. So, and this is not even all of them. There's other risk factors, like this doesn't even include diabetes, for example. Um, but it's just to emphasize the point that there are plenty of things that can be done do to prevent a stroke, and they're highly effective when we know that they work. The hard part is just executing on the plan and getting your blood pressure and all these other risk factors under control. So um, this is exactly what we talk about. There's multiple risk factors and there's multiple treatments and they're all additive. So if you control two out of the three risk factors, you can even more reduce your risk of stroke. So if you have diabetes and hypertension and you control both of those things, it's way better than just controlling one or the other. Um, the common problem we run into is that People are very good about one or two risk factors, but they don't control the third one. And it's the old adage, you're only as um, effective as your weakest link. And so if you don't control your cholesterol, but you control your blood pressure and you control your diabetes, it's not going to really help you all that much because you're, that one risk factor that you're not controlling is going to get you in some way. So we, you really have to be very broad and treat everything that you can um, in order to have the maximum effect on uh, risk. Um, exercise is actually also very important and common, not commonly known that it does have an effect on stroke prevention. It does help prevent stroke. Um, it prevents it directly by reducing the stroke risk. It also reduces your blood pressure. It helps with weight control, helps with cholesterol control. It improves your mood. It actually even improves your memory. Um, so uh, there's a million great effects of exercise and pretty much no downsides to it. The hard part is people just don't like doing it. And the recommendation is that you should be doing about 30 minutes of aerobic exercise at least five days a week and preferably seven days a week. So it's not um, a lot. 30 minutes seems like a lot, but it's really not that much. But it has to be done consistently. And the more you do, the better you get. The more intense your exercise is, the better it is. And I find 80% of the people that I work with don't do any exercise at all or very little. So it's a pretty common one that a lot of people miss because it's not commonly discussed in um, medical appointments, but it should be because it has so many good effects and not just for stroke prevention, but for all sorts of other um, medical issues as well. What are other common preventative treatments that we should address? One is hormone replacement therapy. It's very clear now that it's more harmful than helpful. It used to be thought that hormone replacement therapy pr protected you from heart disease and stroke, it actually turns out to be the opposite, probably because the hormones cause a clotting cyst, uh, phenomenon, because the same thing has been seen with birth control pills. Um, and so the recommendation is just to take it for as little a time as possible. I, I have patients that are in their 80s and 90s that are still on hormone replacement therapy, which has zero need at that point, but they just were put on it a long time ago and they just never stopped it. And there's absolutely no reason to be on that therapy. So if you need it for menopausal symptoms or for some other reason, that's okay. But 
it's definitely a, an exposure thing. The more you're exposed to it, the higher your risk of having a stroke. And most of the patients I've seen with hormone replacement therapy related stroke, they don't have any other risk factors. They, they are pretty healthy otherwise, and that's the only thing that they're doing that's potentially a risk factor. And so it seems like in and of itself, it's a very um, treatable kind of risk factor with a very simple um, intervention. Vitamin therapy does not seem to work. Um, it's very unclear if even fish oil has any benefit for stroke. Some people say yes, some people say no. I, I recommend people eat real fish rather than fish oil because there's other benefits from fish that are not just from the oil itself. Some people prefer to take the fish oil tablets, but again, the relative benefit of that is pretty minor. And a lot of people in California are on herbal supplements and stuff, and they probably don't do much. If anything, they probably make things worse because of all the um, additives that they put in it and the fact that you can't control the doses of things. And so I've definitely had patients that were on multiple herbal supplements that we think probably contributed. It's very hard to prove, but certainly um, when you see people on multiple different supplements like that, you have to worry about um, some side effect from, the, from the, uh, the treatments that they're getting. So we don't recommend that usually. What about alcohol? Um, some people um, take it for medicinal purposes, and this is the, the basis of it. This is so, sort of what, what's called a U-shaped curve in terms of the benefit of versus risk of alcohol. So you can see that if you get above about three drinks per day, you start to increase your risk, although there's a lot of overlap. And if you get below, say, one drink a day, you start to increase on the other end, but again, with a lot of um, overlap. So depending on how you interpret a curve like this, you can do different things. Most doctors feel like if you do two or two drinks a day or less, it's probably okay. You shouldn't do probably more than three. The guideline is that you shouldn't do more than two alcoholic drinks per day for a male and one alcoholic drink per day per female. And the benefits of alcohol, if you're, if you're concerned about that or want that, is has been seen with as little as one drink of alcohol per week. So you really don't need much alcohol if you're looking at the medicinal benefit of it. Um, and certainly there's a harm, uh, clearly, um, when you get up on, into the upper levels. And just remember that these drinks are smaller than the drinks you actually get in real life because real drinks are you know, twice as large. If you go to a restaurant, you're going to get a double pour of Cabernet, and it's going to be two, two um, um, units of alcohol for that class. It's not the same as what um, in these studies they use as ter in terms of what they call a drink per day. So again, just re reiterating that point that it's two drinks a day for men, one drink a day for women. Um, one drink per week has been comparable to um, one drink per day. You shouldn't binge drink it. You don't save up all your drinks for the weekend and drink it all on you know, Saturday uh, and do six drinks at that point. That's just as harmful as uh, drinking um, seven drinks every day pretty much. Um, and it doesn't matter the kind of alcohol. So uh, again, it's, it's pretty modest stuff and um, it's a bit controversial whether you need to drink any alcohol at all for preventative reasons because again, if you look at the bottom of that curve, it's pretty overlapping. And so um, we don't strongly recommend alcohol. We say that if you need, if you want to drink alcohol, it's fine to drink a little bit, but it's not really necessary to do so. Same thing about the diet. Um, it's, it, I'm sure most of you have heard about, you know, what type of diet is recommended, the so-called Mediterranean diet, where you have, you know, a lot of um, un, uh, unsaturated oils like olive oil. You take tree nuts and peanuts and fresh fruits and vegetables and fish especially fatty fish, um, white meat instead of red meat, and wine, um, and you discourage sort of processed food. So th this is nothing s surprising and um, nothing that is unusual, but the hard part is just sticking to something like this because, you know, although it seems really wonderful and, and, it, and it is really wonderful and great, a lot of people are really attracted to soda and commercial baked goods and things that are sort of processed because it's more convenient or tastes good or whatever. So it's one of these things that it's hard to stick to, but it has clear benefits. And, you know, when you look at the, the effect of these um, Mediterranean type diets or low fat diets or combinations or whatever you want to use as sort of a surrogate for that, 
always they show that the benefit is their control compared with a controlled diet. So whichever one you happen to choose is fine as long as you can you can tolerate it and consistently um, um, use the diet. Um, but uh, again, there's pretty good science behind what type of diet seems to work for uh, vascular prevention, not just for stroke, but for all sorts of vascular prevention. So, you know, this, this is, it's pretty straightforward, I think, that um, basically we, we covered a lot of things in terms of the type of strokes that you can treat and what type of treatments we have. So it's definitely tr true that stroke is treatable. It's definitely true that it's preventable. We just went over all sorts of prevention things that we can do for the prevention of stroke. It's very important that time matters, especially on the acute side. So again, the time window for treatment is up to 24 hours, but it's much better to get treated at one hour after your symptoms than at 24 hours. But we can still treat you even up to 24 hours. So you really want to come in as quickly as possible. And it's definitely up to the individual patient. Most of our system is designed around if the patient comes in. We haven't quite figured out how to identify the patient before they come to our attention and unless there's some breakthrough in that regard it's always going to rely on the patient alerting us to the problem and so it really does depend on the individual person to sort of or their family to to make us aware and then once you're within the system you have a lot more options in terms of treatment and um, we've had great success in treating patients and really move that curve like I mentioned in the very beginning we've dropped stroke as the number three cause of death in the U.S. to the number five. And I think it's actually number six or seven now. It's actually dropped even more in the last year or two. So we're being very good about that. Um, but uh, we definitely could get better if we could get more um, patients coming in within a, a reasonable time for those, for those acute treatments. And definitely on the prevention side, stroke has really gone down a lot over the last two or three decades, at least a 30% drop in the um, incidence. But the problem is that the population is aging, so that um, negates the actual numbers. And actually, the total number of strokes is actually slightly rising every year just because of aging, not because our treatments are not effective. But still, um, it's certainly a lot less than it would be if we weren't so effective for our treatments now. So that's all I had to say. And um, hopefully, um, uh, let's see, do we have any questions or anything? about this, but otherwise, um, that's the end of the presentation. I hope uh, this was helpful to you and uh, it was kind of fun to do this, so we should do it again sometime if, uh, if we can organize it. Oh, so. here we go. Uh, do you have statistics by age group, 60, 70, or 80? Um, yes, uh, there are many statistics. I, I don't have them off the top of my head, but in general, as you get older, uh, your risk of stroke rises. So, um, so we definitely, uh, in the U.S., the average age of a stroke patient is in their 70s, usually 75 to 80, something like that. Um, once you get into the lower age range, um, the risk drops substantially. However, there's about 10% of strokes that occur under the age of 50. So even people that are younger are not immune, and it's very, very strongly tied to your risk factors. So almost all the patients or most of the patients that have stroke at a younger age have risk factors that are uncontrolled, like diabetes and stuff like that. And in fact, um, especially among the um, uh, minority population, especially the African-American population, there's a spike in terms of much lower um, age range for their initial stroke, especially for hemorrhagic stroke. So yeah, there are differences between races. There's differences between different um, countries. Um, but in general, what we see is that as you get older, your risk rises. Any other questions? All right. Well, I thank you for your attention. And like I said, I'd be happy to uh, do this again sometime. It's kind of fun. Are we good? Thank you, Dr. Tong. We appreciate thank your you, time Dr. Tong. and your expertise.